Okay, welcome everybody uh, to Beyond the Bugs, playing the management game. I'm gonna look up at everybody out there and I'm gonna look at everybody out here interchangeably, so if you see my eyes flitting back and forth, um, that's not a nervous tick. Uh, if you have questions throughout the presentation, uh, I have a WhatsApp number for you here, that's from Ina in the back. That's 06-146-3655. I'll repeat that again, 06-146-36597. So if you have any questions, please send a message, a text, a WhatsApp message to Ina, and then she will relay that forward back to me. Okay, so today we're going to talk about the value of testing. And there's a lot of different reasons why we could talk about the value of testing, but mainly it has to do with some personal experiences that I've had lately. So, a little introduction. I recently became a father of two twin boys. Um, there's a lot of things you learn as a father of two twin boys, and not least of which is that I've been doing everything wrong my entire life. So every single item or object that I look at is not actually what it's supposed to be uh, used for the way that it's supposed to be. And that's gotten me very confused. See, I thought that tea coasters were meant to put tea on, but no, they're actually meant to be chewed. I don't know if they're tasty. I haven't dared try. Uh, also, oranges. If you have an orange, um, you're not supposed to eat it, no. You're supposed to roll it from one side of the room to the other, and then uh, be very angry that you can't get to it again. But that's what oranges are for. Toys are useless. Boxes, containers. Those are the fun things. Uh, and if any of those boxes happen to be on a table, they have to immediately be thrown off the table. Little boys are the same as cats, for those of you who are cat owners. Uh, but also, unfortunately, the bathtub. The bathtub is where you're supposed to get clean, I thought. But uh, my boys have a different idea of what the bathtub is used for. So why am I going into all of these different things that my boys have decided are true? Well, it's because they seem to look at the same items I do and decide that it has a different value than what I'm used to. I'm used to using the front of the spoon. They think the back of the spoon should go in their mouth. Maybe, I don't know, who am I to say? Maybe there's a value in that. When we're talking about corona, a lot of people here are wearing masks and we think we're doing it right, but um, I think that maybe my boys have a better idea. So, what my boys are doing is an interesting attribute that I think we all may have forgotten about over time. They're taking a look at an object that is used in a certain way, that is valued for a certain thing, a process which people use in a certain way and value for a certain thing. But that doesn't mean it's the only one. And it doesn't mean that it's always going to be valued in that same way. And I think that is something that we really should get back to and that's what this talk is about. So, who am I? Well, I am Rick Tracy. I am a test pathfinder and a test enthusiast. Uh, if you followed the presentation directly before mine, you could uh, label that under the test specialist heading. Uh, I like to do a little bit of everything when it comes to testing. That's because I really love testing. Just ask my wife, I will never shut up about it. Uh, I like agile, I like coaching, I like exploring things. Um, and as I said, I like to point out when the clocks aren't all aligned. Uh, maybe there's something to that. I started out as a psychologist, so say about my mental status what you will based on that. But one thing really has stuck with me from my education and from my career, and that's the goal is the same. What we're looking for is we're here to help people grow. We're here to help people learn, and we're here to help people be aware of the world that's around them. And incidentally, I think that that runs perfectly with what the value of a tester truly can be. When you ask what is the value of a tester, what do testers do? Well, you can get a lot of different answers, depending on who you talk to. So I talked to a bunch of testers, and I tried to get several different answers from what they thought testing was for. Well, what do they do as a tester? Who are they? Now, they said, we find bugs. Hey, cool, that's the title of the presentation. Uh, they also said, 
we focus on how something is made more than whether or not it is made. Uh, we look at the entire scope more often than other disciplines do. We look at risks. We provide test reports. We don't solve bugs. Oh, there's an interesting one. Uh, the roles isn't really respected. Oh, we're seen as an extra member of a team. Uh-oh, uh, we have no time or budget to test well or the way we want to. And managers just want testers to automate. That was um, unsettling to hear, but the most common one I heard is nobody reads a test report. That is also fairly unsettling. And that made me question, well, what is the value if we don't even see value in ourselves? So I decided, let's ask other disciplines. Let's ask non-testers. What do we as testers do? Well, we find bugs. <laughs> hey, what else do we do? We check other people's work. Nice. Uh, we ensure quality. OK. We improve quality, we hope. We police development standards. Oh, if only. Uh, we automate tests, right, Meta? <laughs> Uh, we add work at the end of development. Oh, hey, hold on, what? Uh, we decide whether we can go live with an item. Oh, I didn't know we had that power. Uh, we don't really build anything. Cool. Um, it's not very nice, I think. Uh, I don't agree with about half of this list, but it's somewhat understandable that these impressions occur because they're missing a lot of the things that we do as testers, but we never really talk about as testers. So. That got me thinking, why are we hired? The people who hire us, why do they hire us? Why do they want us there? Why do they want testers? So we asked managers and organizations, what do testers do? Guess what the first answer was? We find bugs. Cool. That's why we're so valuable, because we find bugs. We also send test reports, which, again, nobody reads. Uh, we give the go-ahead for the team to send items to production. Again. I have never actually had that power as a tester in a team. I don't know if any of you have ever had complete veto power over that, but that would be cool. Uh, we cost a lot of money. Uh, we're a net cost center. We don't have a clear value independent of the work developers do. We have an unclear return on investment. I don't really know what the testers are doing. OK, again, understandable, but wow, is there more to testing than this? And I really, really hope that none of you watching right now were nodding along saying, yeah, yeah, that's us. We, we cost a lot of money. We don't really have clear value. If you do, this presentation is for you, so stick with it. Let's talk about the landscape of testing. What do we do as testers? Uh, what are we looking at? Well, mainly, everything can be boiled down to a process. What is a process? Well, a process is an item combined with an action leading to a result. Uh, you could be working for a bank. And in that bank, you would take money and transfer it to somewhere else and take a look at that result. That's a process. Uh, if you were in retail, you would have an item that is sold to a customer, and then that customer gets it. If you are an auditor, you look to see if the actions that people are taking uh, have a certain standard, a certain result. Pretty much everything that's being tested can fall under what is a process. So where is the value added in that for a tester? Well, we can look at all three factors, the item, the action, and the result. Under the item, we add value by exploring items. We add value by using knowledge to shape tests and to inform the team about what we found. We also contribute to the design work and development, and if we don't, we should. Once you know a lot about the item, you can start talking about the actions or the system in which it's running. You can understand how it moves inside that system. You can, uh, you can use the system to understand what's in the system itself and how it works in the whole organization. You increasingly, increasingly, increasingly expand that scope. And in the end, you have to say something about that total result. Now, whether you say everything about the entire system every time or just parts of the system, that's up to your goal at the time. But I think that we add value on every single level inside this organization. But just saying that doesn't really convince people. So for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to go over three different types of arguments when I talk about what our values are. The first one is conceptual. 
Most testers seem to like this. We simply ask ourselves the question, does the idea make logical sense? Do I understand it in context? Is it something I can explain to somebody else? Can they understand it? Does it fit with the goals of the organization? Can I make the argument that this is a concept that's valuable? Okay. What about its practical use? Can I convince somebody else that my value is of use to them? Can I use it? Can somebody else use it? What is the impact? Who is helped by it? Who is hindered by it? Who is slowed down by the fact that we're making certain things? And what are the systemic results? And lastly, and very important for managers, is monetary. How much does it cost? Do I get any return investment? How much will I pay up front? Does it create any value directly? Now, just because these ones are linked typically to different people, like uh, people who are more conceptual, people who are more practical, I think every single person does take a look at these three arguments when deciding whether they agree or disagree with something having value. The monetary one is a useful one for managers, and since I called this playing the management game, I would suggest you kind of get into this, because the numbers can be a lot of fun. Let me show you what I mean. Let's take a situation in which uh, we're going to assume a team of three developers and one tester, and we're going to ignore the other roles for right now, not that they're not important, but for simplicity's sake. Um, in every version that we put out once a month, there's a thousand issues. And based on how much effort and time and customer interaction it costs us to solve that, we have different rates at which those issues can be solved. If it's done at the design phase, it's going to cost us one, one euro. If we catch it at the development phase, it's going to cost us 10 euros. If we catch it at the testing phase, after development is, quote, done, then it's going to cost us 100 euros. And if the customers have to find it and send it back to us, it'll cost us 1,000 euros and our reputation. So keep that in mind for the calculations coming up. What's the concept? Well, a product is made and it has issues. There was no investment in testing. We saved a whole lot of money. Uh, but in practice, the developers also find some bugs. You know, they're, they're good at this. They're good at their jobs. They know how to find issues with unit tests or some things that just maybe we didn't think about in the requirements. So they find 250 of the bugs. But 750 of those bugs, they end up being found by the users. And with the 1 10 100,000 model, that's very expensive. We're looking at a single version costing us an equivalent of three quarters of a million euros. This is why we're labeled a cost center if we don't do something about this. Well, let's say we do something about this and we say, let's add manual functional testers, just the very basic testing that we can add to this. We apply it and we say, well, it's gonna cost us some money, but by doing so, we will find those 250, and we'll find 350 more that the testers find during the test phase. Well, now the users only find 400 of those, and the testers found those 350s. We moved it from 1,000 to 100, and uh, guess what? That cost drops below half a million, which means that we saved the company 300,000. By the way, that's a return on investment of above 200,000%. That's all we really need, actually. I could just cut the presentation right here. You show this to a manager, you let them do the math, that's it. Just bring it back from the users to the testers, you save them 300,000 euros. But we're not finished, because this isn't the only thing we do. We don't just find bugs. Again, this means that we've got 40% less defects on the customer side, too, so they're happier with us. We also do automated verifications. We set up test automation. We can use that to make our lives a little easier as testers. That also costs money. We've got to buy a tool. We've got to check that tool doesn't uh, end up, um, you know, upfront cost for a tool can be pretty high, but we're going to put it per month. So per month, we've got a new cost. And it takes a little bit more, uh, a little bit more items are found in testing, because now we can find the standard ones, the 350, and then say testers find 150 more, because they now have time. They now can look deeper. They can now find some more, but they're not going to find another 300 straight up, so let's not get unreasonable. But what we do find 
is again, we're shifting it back, and now the defects found by the customer are only 250, which means 66 less defects on the customer side. Suddenly, customer is a lot happier with us, and we reduce the cost by 56% down to the exact amount that we saved them the first time, which, oh, look, we're actually getting a lower return on investment. Well, that's because we've invested more. So now that we've invested more and we've given ourselves a little bit more time as testers, I think we can do a little bit more valuable testing. So let's do some design and requirements testing. Let's not just do the testing afterwards. Let's shift left and do the testing before something is ever made. So we're going to make it so that every bug that could have been found later can now be found, well, not every, but several bugs that could have been found later are going to be found sooner. Say about 150 of them. I know it's not a whole lot, but 150 can make a big difference because this only costs us 150 euros. So we've got 150 bugs found in the static testing design. We found 250 from our developers. We're going to find slightly less because we need to take some time to do the static testing. But the users now have only 125 bugs. That means that there's 83% less defects for the users. You think they're going to be happier about that, or are they still going to complain? Just out of curiosity. People in the room? Happier? happier? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, happier? OK, great. I love your optimism. Um, <laughs> uh, we're also going to see a cost reduction for us of 73% from our original. Now we're at 175,000. Before, we were at 750,000, now we're at 175,000. That's a savings of 550,000 for a return investment of almost 2,000. Again, who wants to buy this deal? Or shall I go higher? We want, we want more, we want more. OK, great. You want to get above that 2,000. OK, so what about if we talk about support and informative testing? What do I mean by that? I mean, when you test, guess what? We know about some issues. We've explored the system, we understand the system, we know how the system works inside and out, we know how customers might, may react, maybe they'll be happy with this, maybe they won't, we know what things we've accepted as potential risks, and guess what? We can tell operations that. We can talk to our support colleagues about that. We can even write them down in a document and send them along with the product and say, hey, you might experience this bad result. If so, this is how you handle it. So just with the communication, again, we're not investing anything else here. We're just talking to more people. We can save our support department a lot of money. Now, how do we do that? Well, support people have to take calls. First line support takes calls from clients. These calls can add up, and it takes their time. We have to pay those people, usually. So let's say we save them 15 minutes of every uh, hour-long call. And let's say we can apply this to only just five calls uh, per month on any issue that we find. Only five. So we're, very, we're low balling this very much. However, with that, we can save 50 euros per issue. Now, we had 1,000 issues, right? So we're saving 50 per issue. That's here, the issues for the users. Suddenly, we have a cost reduction for support of 25,000. That's nice. So we assume about 500 accepted issues exist for every 1,000 unaccepted issues. Um, what we really want to show here is that just because we know there's 1,000 doesn't mean that there's not more. So this will help this, uh, with those ones that we, uh, that we didn't know were there before. What does that mean, again, monetarily? Well, we now have a cost reduction of 76%. We're down to 150, sorry, 177,000 in total uh, when you add the investment. We're at 83% less defects on the customer side still, so they're still happy with us. And our return investment is now above 2,000. We're now 2,090. Think we can do better? Yeah. Yeah, Menno says yeah. Excellent. I think so too. Because here's a funny thing. Um, we're testers, and the word I associate the most with testing, after, of course, bugs, is risk. We look at risk. Everything around us, we know the risk, we think about the risk, we examine the risk, we explore the risks. I know it sounds very negative, but most of us find it fun. <laughs> um, 
So why aren't we talking about what our value is when it comes to risk? We, as testers, can actually act as an insurance on risk. Now, how does this work? Well, conceptually, we can provide a risk profile. On everything that's built, on every functionality or quality aspect, we can look, what is the risk? What is the risk to performance? What is the risk to security? What is the risk to functionality? Or any other things that we want to call. And we can provide focus on those areas before and after development. So we can say, hey, based on this design, this looks like it's going to be pretty risky in security. It might open up a lot of things. Um, or afterwards, you can say, hey, based on what we've built and how it seems to be running with the system, it's a little unstable, so our performance may go down. So we know this ahead of time. And we can insure against this. How do we calculate that? Well, in practice, we're doing the same thing as before, but now, we're thinking, what's the probability something can be insured, can be prevented, and how much would it cost us? Performance problems are pretty big nowadays. Um, a lot of people need things immediately, or else they'll go to a different site. Uh, E-commerce especially has this problem. So we're going to value that fairly high, at about 100,000. But there's no way we're going to cover a good chunk of that just by knowing what our issues to performance would be. I don't know if any of you have ever done really in-depth performance testing, but even the best performance testing can't catch everything. So let's say only 10% of that can be covered. Functional problems, on the other hand, cheaper, easier to find. We know generally what it's supposed to do, so let's say we can catch half of those. Security problems, on the other hand. Uh, those of you who have followed the news lately probably know that security is a big issue. Um, very expensive consequences if things go wrong. And I, I wish I had an audience here of more than just two guys, but I'm going to get your opinion anyway. How many of you actually have dedicated security testing at your company? Okay. Uh, one third, uh, sorry, one fourth of the room uh, raised their hand. So that's not great. <laughs> I know the companies I've worked in in the last few years also don't have any dedicated security testing or any dedicated uh, security system beyond maybe one or two people. And these are for massive systems. Um, that means, at best, we can cover maybe 5% of that. Uh, other problems, other aspects, we can look at about a little bit more than functionality. So 10,000, we can cover about 10% of that. So again, these are just the risk profiles that we can reasonably know might go wrong. So that insurance can be valued at about 26,000. That's how much we can say we'll probably be able to make sure this doesn't happen, just based on the risk profiles alone. So what does that mean again? Well, now we've got a cost reduction by 80%. We're at 151,000. Remember, we started with 3 quarters of a million. We have the same amount of defects. But our return on investment has jumped up to 2185. I think we can still go higher. Yes. Yeah, great. All right, let's go higher. Product reliability. This is a word that I actually expected to be more associated with testers when I asked them what, is, uh, uh, what does a tester do. And reliable was said by maybe three or four of them that what we can do is we can ensure, in essence, or we can at least try to work towards our items being more reliable. The more we know about something, the better. The more we can measure, the more we can control. If you don't measure, you can't control because you've got no idea whether what you did actually made any impact. So we need to be able to find a way to make metrics. So we gear in some metrics. We measure uh, for reliability and control, and we don't do this just for ourselves. This is where we get to make the project managers happy. Because one of the most expensive things for a company is if a project fails. There's a lot of investment put into it. There's a lot of time and money and effort and design and stakeholder management that's involved in a project. And if that project fails, that all goes away. It's just gone. That value is no more. So, what we want to do is we want to cause the project to have less of a chance to fail. And I think that we can at least contribute to about 10% of that. Now, how do we do that? Well, same practices in the previous scenarios, but now we're going to get some metrics. Originally, when I designed this slide, 
I was looking at the metrics that I had to install and figure out how to use and figure out how to uh, customize for a company. And I realized that that was taking me a lot of time and that was a lot of investment because this was not an area of my expertise. I was not a, a person who had designed full metrics for reliability before, didn't really know what I was doing. <clears throat> so I decided to do maybe the one smart thing and look online for a tool, some tool that could do this. Maybe, maybe I'd have to pay a little bit out of pocket, but it was definitely gonna be better than the about 50, 56,000 that I'd been calculating on investment. Well, I found a tool that was 34, uh, 34 euros per month. So that, then I looked at this and I thought, okay, well here I had you know, a lot of extra time, I had about 50,000 there, I had 6,000 there, and I thought, well, I, I could just add 34 to that number. M maybe that's a better step. So if you ever have an argument with a manager about whether you should be allowed to look at tools outside of your company rather than making one yourself, maybe try that argument. Maybe try saying, hey, you know how much uh, it costs to pay somebody to build a tool versus maybe a tool already existing? This doesn't mean that we didn't provide value. By noticing that that tool existed, we have brought that to the attention of the company, we've brought it into the company, and now the tool can do the job. We've added value. Even though it wasn't directly us, so you can save your ego, but <laughs> we still did it. So let's say we buy that tool, right? So we have a metrics, uh, metrics measuring tool that gives reports to the project manager. The project manager is able to steer a little better and, and make sure that the, the reliability of our project stays high. Let's say about 10%. Again, lowballing that, I think we can do better. But just with that, we've added an actual value. Huh? This is not a cost reduction. We've actually added a value to the project not failing. So that's about valued at about 11,000. 10% of a project failing. That means we've got a cost reduction by 81% rather than 80. It means, again, the same amount of defects on the customer side. Return of investment has now pumped up to 2,222%. And we've got 11,000 euros protected in reliability value. 10% less chance of a project failure. That's, that's the reason why. So I don't know if... if I've lost half of you with all these numbers and calculations. Please do look over them again when, we get, uh, when I get finished with this. But seriously, we started with a cost of three quarters of a million. And just through the actions that I don't think are even all that extreme for a tester to do. You don't have to be a super test specialist that can do 26 different things. Just through these first six things, you're, you're down to 140,000. If that doesn't impress a manager enough to throw you a party, I don't know what will. But hey, let's add one more thing. Innovation testing. I don't think that testers uh, give themselves enough credit or get enough credit for what they create for a team. And I'm not just talking about reliability or risk profiles or a good design or checking their work or anything like that. I'm talking about ideas. Because a tester tends to think a little differently. And by that I mean they think like my boys. They say, hey, that thing is useful that way, but maybe also useful a different way. And if we use it that way, oh, then we can do this with the system. And if we've changed the system that way, then the system over here will react this way. We know this because it went bad uh, two, two releases ago. But if we do it the right way, then it goes well. And then that system can lead to this new functionality that we can offer the client. How many of you have actually had that conversation with a manager before? Because I don't think it's very many. I don't think you actually listen to that voice in your head much anymore. But what we do is our observations lead to innovation. And our observations lead to new opportunities. The things we learn while we're testing can immediately be used in our organization. We can produce things, we can build things. We're not just there to police everyone else's work. We can come up with ideas. And the ideas we can come up with can be grandiose, they can be small, but say them. Talk to your manager about them. Be the person who provides the innovation testing, the innovation value, 
And that's going to be probably even more than that 600,000 we've already saved them. So, testers, we add value by, yes, manually finding bugs that would otherwise bother users. We do do that. But we also create automation which finds systemic bugs faster and more efficiently. We test requests, requirements, and designs, and that prevents flaws from entering the system in the first place. We give information about a product, a process, or potential bugs that can help support operations or customers themselves. We can project uh, risks and build on insurance. We can make tests and test reports reliable and relatable to people so that they can understand what it is and steer correctly. And we can generate ideas for innovation and improvement. But that requires some investment. What do you need to invest for testing? Well, when you get down to the fundamentals, which is the last one here, but the test areas, you've got skills, automation, static testing, awareness, risk, alignment, fundamentals. These are all investments that you can make, or your company can make in you, in order to make testing better. Under skills, you can attend, hey, conferences, courses, workshops. You can go to test events. If you want to know more about automation, you can join a special interest group for automation or tooling, or you can go to see demos from vendors. They want you to come. They want to show you things. That's literally the only thing they do. They show you the demos. Go find out more about it. Uh, static testing. You can do some agile testing training. They're great at teaching static testing. You can do refinement and design projects with your business analysts. Work together with them. Awareness. Communication workshops. Demos. Info evenings, the same as for the uh, automation and learning. Uh, risk, learn how to do risk-based testing. Create a template for yourself. Learn how to do risk management and help the business do risk management. Use your knowledge to help the, make them better. Uh, join a risk storming workshop. It's a really fun thing. Uh, Google it. Um, alignment, you can do unified test approaches with other testers. You can create a test guild. You can talk about testing all day. OK, no cheers, sorry. Uh, but you can. Uh, and then when you talk about the fundamentals, take a look at your test data and improve it. Just say, we're, gonna, we're just going to improve the test data today. That's what we're going to do. Uh, look at your test environment and say, you know what? We're going to improve our test environment today. We're not going to wait. We're not going to wait until it all breaks down. We're going to do it proactively. We're going to do it ahead of time. We're going to get those fundamentals. These are all arguments that usually you need to make to your manager. So first show them this. And then ask for that, because when you can do all these investments, when these investments come, you're going to get results. You're going to get faster testing. You're going to find more bugs. You're going to have an earlier uptake of items from the backlog, because you can help. You're going to have new innovations. You're going to have better formulated business requests, cross-team support, happier testers. Yeah, that's a goal, too. And then, of course, you want to measure these things, because your manager may ask you, OK, Prove it. Prove those numbers. Prove that this is going to happen. Well, go through it and show them. Show them your cycle times. Show them your ratio of bugs found versus the production issue. Don't just count the bugs. The ratio is important. Uh, full cycle times. User report of reliability. Ask your stakeholders, are they happier? Uh, do team reports on, uh, on requests. So uh, if, if the change isn't clear, have the team come up and say, hey, can you make this more clear? Uh, do cross-domain projects, show what projects you've done, and ask the testers if they're happier. Measure these things, really check it, and then translate it to business value. We're talking about the management game again. You want to talk about skills? Why should they invest in skills? Well, we'll get faster time to market. We'll save money on production issues. Cool. Automation, why should I invest in that? Well, we'll have faster time to market, and we'll save money on production issues. Oh, that sounds familiar. Uh, what about static testing? Well, we can do faster time to market, and we can solve some production issues. Awesome, OK. Awareness. Well, we've got better customer trust. Our customers will like us better because we can explain our system better. And we've got new innovative projects that we thought of that they can use and that you can sell. Oh, cool, I can sell things, great. Uh, what about the risk? Well, we can save money on production issues, just like, you know, up there. Hey, that, that was great. Um, and again, we can have better customer trust in our systems. Oh, which means we can sell more things. Oh, that's good news. Alignment. We can use those new innovative projects to align between the teams, which means, again, faster time to market and save money on production issues. Now we're talking their language. 
What about those fundamentals, though? Why should I pay for you to work on your test environment and your test data? Well, um, it's faster time to market, and it prevents production issue, but also incredibly importantly, and let's not undervalue this, it recruits better testers. Because I don't know about you, but if I end up in a company where the test data is shit and the test environment is terrible, and every single time I run a test, I have to ask myself, was this the environment or was this a bug? I'm going to go nuts, and I'm going to not want to go there anymore, and I'm going to look for something else. And if you really want to get the best testers and the testers who are really interested in finding more than just bugs, you've got to work on those fundamentals. Before, when I introduced myself, I called myself a pathfinder. Now, I want to talk a little bit about what is a test pathfinder, because while a lot of this is about what you do to talk to your manager about what the future for testing is in their organization, I think a lot of people also have a question is, what's the future of testing for myself? How am I going to make testing and being a tester more valuable for myself? Uh, I stumbled into this role as a test pathfinder. I didn't even know it existed. And what it comes down to is a lot of things that you probably also do as a tester. What my goals are is to improve the quality of a process or a product. Uh, I want to empower others so that they can do the same. I want to monitor and improve communication across organization levels. I want to help coordinate efforts. I want to be able to measure test maturity and engage in initiatives that help the company to grow. And I want to design frameworks for better testing. This is what we're talking about when we're talking about increasing the value. And this is what we're talking about when you do your testing. Oop. So one of the things that I primarily do is I explore not just what's going on now, but also the past. What was your past in your organization? And then we use that to chart a path to the future. So a lot of the times as a pathfinder, you are, yes, engaging in testing and helping people with test initiatives, but you're also looking, where's the next step? Where's the next value? What's the next thing we can do to make testing better? What's the next thing I can do to make my job more interesting? What's the next thing I can do to be a happier tester? So how do we provide value then, again, business? Well, as a test pathfinder, if you wanted to do this, if you're wondering what a future as a pathfinder might look like, you would be focusing on teaching essential skills for testing, not just to testers, to anybody who wanted to know about testing and quality. You would be working on designing frameworks for testing and automation, not just building them, but designing the whole framework around it. You could expand the scope that's being tested from functional to exploratory to everything that you want, you can expand it. You can support and induce knowledge uh, knowledge sharing across all levels. B set up a test guild. Become the product owner of that test guild and make sure people share information. You can increase awareness of risk and risk management. I cannot stress enough how amazing testers are at giving risk management workshops to, business to, to the business side. Just showing them that there's more options than prevent is big enough. You can align teams for reliable results and criteria. Again, alignment's very important. But finally, pathfinders improve testing by co-creating, supporting, and maintaining those foundations. Just spending a few months working on the foundations for, for an organization will provide so much value, not just for you, not just for them, but every poor tester who's been suffering from a bad foundation. This is all stuff that you can do as you grow into a more, in my opinion, mature testing world where testing is seen not just as finding bugs. Because if we don't have those fundamentals, we might as well not even try to do the other seven things. Because, yeah, your return on investment, if every test is unreliable, will be close to zero. Testing is more valuable than just finding the bugs. And if you want to do pathfinding, it works on all seven levels of those values, and I think that if you take a look at how you can contribute to any one of those seven items, you'll find six or seven new activities to do every single day in your organization. Show the results, measure those, measure those results, show those results, talk to your manager about it, tell them your ideas, and that's how you go beyond the bugs. Thank you. <laughs> questions? No questions on WhatsApp? Yeah. What about in the room? Uh, 
Uh, I actually talked to quite a few people who are working on TPI projects. There's a guy in Germany I was working with, uh, Peter Hartur. Um, he, uh, he actually gave me the basis for calculating these values. Um, and when we talk about improving uh, uh, the process of testing, I think he's talking more about how to enhance what we're already doing. What I want to add to that discussion is what can we do that we're not already doing? And what are things that just naturally occur when we test that we should highlight and maybe sell to managers? That's kind of how I see the relationship. I hope that answers your question, I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you very much, and have a great rest of the conference. <laughs>